So one of the important things is that if you have an organized way of approaching an ECG, it becomes uh, much easier to interpret. So here are the eight rules that I use whenever I'm interpreting an ECG. So I usually start with the rate, the rhythm, the axis, the intervals, chambers looking at enlargement, waveforms and R-wave progression, then the ST segment and T-wave changes, and then uh, the eighth rule is to look at the ECG as a whole and to come up with your own impression. So when you go through these eight uh, questions, you think about uh, what you're asking yourself for each. So for rate, you're asking yourself, is this a tachycardia, a bradycardia, or is it a normal rate? For rhythm, you're asking yourself, is this sinus, and are there P waves before every QRS? And is there a normal P wave axis, meaning is this sinus? Because you can have P waves before the QRS, they may not be, com be coming from the uh, sinus, uh, the sinoatrial node. Um, then you want to ask yourself about the axis, specifically the QRS axis, whether or not this is left, right, extreme, or a normal axis. And we'll get into the definition of these later in the lecture. Then we can look at the intervals, so the PR interval, the QRS duration, and the QT or QTC, and ask yourself if these are normal, prolonged, or shortened. Uh, then, then you can look at the chambers of the heart, so basically kind of marching through all four chambers, starting right atria, left atria, um, right ventricle, and left ventricle. Then looking for uh, waveforms, basically you're asking yourself, is this the normal waves that you would expect based on the normal conduction of the ECG? And if the R wave progression is normal. And then you're also going to be asking yourself, are there Q waves, which can sometimes be uh, indicative of uh, prior infarction? And is the R wave progression normal? Uh, next, you can look at the ST segment and T wave changes. So the big thing that people tend to look for are ST elevations or depressions, which can sometimes indicate ischemia or infarction. And then you want to see if there are any T wave inversions or abnormalities. And then the eighth rule is to look for your, is to think about your impression. So you kind of synthesize the um, clinical picture along with uh, what you're seeing on the ECG. So to see if there's any abnormalities in electrolytes, if you see a bundle branch block, and uh, this kind of takes a, takes into account the uh, previous seven steps. So first, starting out with rate, um, you can. You can first calculate it by taking the um, taking 300 and dividing it by the number of large squares between the R to R interval. Additionally, you can also try to count the number of boxes between the uh, QRS in order to get an estimation of the rate. So if there's one big box between the uh, R waves, this is usually a rate of 300. Two boxes, 150. Three boxes, 100. Four boxes, 75. Five boxes, 60. And then six boxes, 50. Once you get further than that, it uh, doesn't hold up as much, but this is a good approximation. Additionally, uh, with the ECGs that we use here at Yale, there tends to be a rhythm strip at the bottom. So if you count the, the number of QRSs and multiply by six, this should give you the number for 60 seconds as the rhythm strip is 10 seconds long. So some definitions to think of are tachycardia, which is going to be a rate of greater than 100 beats per minute, and bradycardia, which is usually less than 60. Some sources will say it's less than 50. Outside of that, you want to ask yourself some questions about rhythm, which is the second step for ECG interpretation. So you're going to want to see if it is a regular or irregular rhythm. So this is asking yourself whether the distance between the QRS complexes is constant, which would mean it's a regular rhythm or if it's not constant, so it would be an irregular rhythm. Then you want to see if there is a P wave before every QRS. And usually from this you can infer that the P wave is the, uh, the uh, source of the, the depolarization causing the ventricles to become depolarized. If there's a P wave, you want to know if there's a normal P wave axis, which could imply that the P wave is coming from the sinus node. So again, just to kind of recap, you're asking yourself if it's regular versus irregular. Are there sinus P waves? And then you can also see if there's other P wave morphologies, 
So when the sinus node is not functioning or the rhythm is not being conducted to the ventricle, sometimes you can see some other rhythms uh, which are termed escape rhythms. So you can have an ectopic atrial rhythm. So in this, you would have P waves, but they would not be sinus P waves. And they would be before every QRS. A junctional escape is when the uh, rhythm is coming from the AV node and will usually be a narrow complex. Um, and uh, then a ventricular escape is when the uh, rhythm is coming from the ventricles, and this will be a wide complex. So taking a look at this, so this is again our normal ECG. We can see that it's a regular rhythm, meaning that the R to R intervals are pretty much constant, and we can march them out throughout. And then we also see here that there's a P wave before every QRS, and this P wave is positive in lead one, lead two, and uh, lead three. So some examples of irregular rhythms, as you can see here, would be atrial fibrillation. So we see that basically the R to R interval here is not equal to the R to R interval here. And this is because the uh, phocis, <laughs> foci of the uh, depolarization in the atria is coming from multiple points uh, of, from the atria rather than from the sinus node. Another uh, rhythm to think about is atrial flutter with variable block. So we can see here that the R to R interval here is different than the R to R interval here. So the actual depolarization of the atria is constant um, as atrial flutter comes from, from uh, the tricuspid annulus. But we can see that its conduction to the ventricle is actually irregular here. Other thoughts too are, are multifocal atrial tachycardia in which there's different foci in the atria that are the origin of the depolarization. And we see that there, that there is a P wave before every QRS, but the P wave morphologies are different, which can tell us that this is uh, not coming from the sinus node, but rather different foci. So here's, a, here's an example of a regular rhythm that is actually not from the sinus node. So before when we were looking at the normal ECG, when I was saying that the, um, we saw nice positive P waves before every QRS in lead one, lead two, uh, lead three, and AVF, here we can see that it's actually negative in lead two, negative in lead three, and negative in AVF. So this means that the, uh, the site of the depolarization is actually moving uh, from, the, from the bottom of the atria and actually moving upward. So in the opposite direction. So although this is a regular, a regular rhythm, we can say that this is in sinus because we don't have nice positive P waves in lead two, lead three, and lead ABF. So next we can we can look at axis and specifically talking about the QRS axis. So when I was drawing the normal conduction, we said that uh, normally there's a positive R wave in lead two because the summation of the vectors from the left ventricle and the right ventricle is usually uh, approximately at 60 degrees. So we can say that if, if, the, um, if the summation of these vectors is somewhere between negative 30 and 90 degrees, that it, this is a normal axis, kind of within the margin of error. And then if it is leftward of negative 30 degrees, that it is a left axis deviation, so negative 30 to negative 90. But if it is rightward of positive 90, so somewhere between positive 90 and positive 180, we have a right axis deviation. And if we are even more rightward than positive 180, so somewhere between 180 and negative 90, this is what we would call an extreme axis. So here's an example of some of the patterns that you can think about when you're looking at axis deviation. So in a normal axis, if you look at lead one and lead ABF, there should be R waves. So the maximum or the uh, deflection of the QRS should be positive in lead one and lead ABF. So you can remember this as thinking that the uh, R waves are, that the QRS is up and up. So everything's on the up and up, it's normal. Then thinking of the of left axis deviation, uh, this is a silly mnemonic, but you can think of it this way that 
the QRS complexes are like a couple. So basically, the, um, it is up in one and down in ABF. So they're going in different directions, so they've left each other, so a left axis deviation. Then you, for a right axis deviation, you can think about it as it's down in ABF and it's up in one. They're coming towards each other. This is a right axis deviation. And then uh, for an extreme axis, it's going to be down in one and down in ABF, which is the exact opposite of normal. So some causes that you can think of for a for left and right axis deviations. So for a left axis deviation, there's the left anterior fascicular block. You could have a uh, pacemaker causing abnormal conduction in the ventricles. Extreme left ventricular hypertrophy can cause left axis deviation. But usually the, the most common cause of a left axis deviation is actually a left anterior fascicular block. Other causes, a inferior wall MI and different types of uh, wolf parkinson white. So with the inferior wall MI, you can think of it as basically losing the uh, forces that are directed more towards the right, causing the uh, overall conduction to be directed towards the left. Causes of right axis deviation include a left posterior fascicular block, um, pacemakers, extremes of right ventricular hypertrophy, a large anterior wall MI for the same reasons that an inferior wall MI can cause this, and some other types of the Wolf Parkinson White, which is a abnormal accessory pathway that can cause the conduction of the ventricles to be abnormal. So again, um, the next step that we're going to look at is looking at the intervals. So we have the PR interval, which starts from starts at the beginning of the P wave and goes to the uh, beginning of the QRS, and then we have the QRS uh, complex and the QRS duration, which starts at the beginning of the, the Q wave and ends at the end of the S wave. And uh, then we have the QT interval, which begins at the beginning of the QRS complex and finishes at the end of the T wave. So for the, for the uh, normal intervals, usually the PR interval is going to be uh, less than 200 milliseconds. So 200 milliseconds is one big box on the ECG paper. So it should usually be less than one big box if you're, if you're taking a quick look at the ECG. But it should be uh, more than 120 milliseconds, which is three little boxes. The QRS duration should usually be less than 100 milliseconds, which is two and a half little boxes. And then the QT interval, um, we, we'll talk a little bit more about the specifics of that. But if you're looking quickly at the ECG, it should be about less than one half of the R to R interval. And the QT interval is going to be dependent upon heart rate. So for a normal PR, uh, interval, as we had said before, it's 120, uh, which is three little boxes, to 200, which is one big box, or five little boxes, uh, milliseconds. So causes of a short PR can be pre-excitation, such as uh, WPW. So in this syndrome, there are there is uh, an abnormal conduction, which causes the um, impulses from the atria to be sent to the ventricle faster than the pause in the AV node. Other things that, that you can see is if uh, there's a P wave that uh, is a uh, junctional rhythm or a non-sinus rhythm where the P wave is not associated with the QRS. A low atrial pacemaker is also another, another potential cause. So in this condition, uh, we see that basically the impulse from the atria is much lower than the sinus node, so this is causing it to be causing the PR interval to be shorter. Causes of a prolonged PR are conduction system disease such as AV blocks. So there's various degrees of these, but uh, if you at, at very least have a PR interval of greater than 200 milliseconds, uh, 
Q at least have a first degree AD block. Hypokalemia is another cause. And uh, RCA ischemia can sometimes cause um, ischemia to the AV node, causing uh, prolonged conduction, causing a PR to be longer than 200 milliseconds. So here's an example of a short PR. So we can see right here, P wave is here is starting here, and then the QRS starts here. So this is about three little boxes. So this is uh, less than 120 milliseconds. Um, so from there we can see that this is a delta wave, which is something that's classically seen in Wolf Parkinson White, which uh, shows that there is an accessory pathway. So there is uh, conduction that bypasses the AV node, causing the uh, excitation of the ventricle before uh, conduction through the AV node. So here we can see there's a long PR. So basically, this is uh, wider than one big box. So we see one big box right here, or five little boxes within it. So this is pro uh, prolonged PR. So then next we can go to the QRS duration. So a normal QRS duration is usually less than 100 milliseconds or two and a half little boxes. So causes of a wide QRS can include either bundle branch blocks, so basically uh, disease in the conduction where there is cell to cell conduction. Pacemakers, um, where an electrical impulse is being provided by the pacemaker um, the implanted pacemaker, uh, causing there to be a lot of cell-to-cell -cell conduction in the ventricle. PVCs, so this is basically a abnormal conduction coming from the uh, myocytes in the ventricle. Ventricular tachycardia, so an abnormal conduction that's, that's being propagated also through the ventricle. The later stages of hyperkalemia cause conduction uh, problems that can lead to a wide QRS. Ventricular escape rhythms where uh, the conduction of the heart is being run by the myocytes in the ventricle. Pre-excitation in Wolf Parkinson White as we had seen previously. Different drugs and then electrolyte disturbances as we had said before hyperkalemia. Mm -hmm. So we can see that, that uh, here is a wide complex regular rhythm that is, that is um, ventricular tachycardia. So we see that we have this wide QRS that kind of marches out through here. And it's really hard to say what the cause is, but uh, we can uh, just say that this is uh, ventricular tachycardia. Here's another example of this too, um, but we can see kind of clear P waves before each QRS. So this is a left bundle branch block, which we'll be talking about a little bit more later in the lecture. And uh, here we see an irregular wide complex, and this is an individual with a right bundle branch block and atrial fibrillation. So the Initiation of conduction is, is coming from the atria and the multiple atrial foci seen in atrial fibrillation. Um, but there's abnormal conduction due to a right bundle branch block. So the QT interval, um, as we were talking about before, can it can vary with heart rate. So there is this QTC or the corrected QT interval. So usually we say that it's less than 440 milliseconds in a man and less than 460 milliseconds in a woman. And uh, the way that we calculate this is with Bizet's formula. So the QTC is going to be equal to the QT in milliseconds over the square root of the R to R interval in seconds. So although we say that 440 is normal for a man and 460 is normal for a woman, greater than 500 milliseconds is a higher risk for torsa de point, which is an abnormal, um, an abnormal conduction. And uh, I like to think of torsades as basically um, there is a uh, what's called an R on T phenomenon. So uh, 
as the QTC gets longer, there's a risk of the of a PVC or some other conduction happening while the um, while the heart is not ready to accept the next depolarization, and that can cause abnormal conduction called torsades. So, um, so basically, the the normal QT is less than 440 to 460 milliseconds, as we had said before. So, some causes of a short QTC are hypercalcemia, digoxin, hyperthyroidism, increased sympathetic tone, um, such as uh, catecholamines, and many different uh, situations. Causes of long QT, many different drugs, including amiodarone, dofetilide, sotalol. TCAs, hazel antifungals, macrolides, quinolones, antipsychotics, methadone, uh, odansetron, and many more. Uh, sodium and uh, potassium channelopathies can cause uh, long QT. MI can cause a long QT. Rheumatic fever, cardiomyopathy, and other electrolyte disorders as well. So looking at the chambers, you can start with the right atria. So basically, what you can think of is uh, there's criteria based on lead 2 and lead V1. So basically, the conduction of the right atria is directed down lead 2. So basically, if you enlarge the right atria, you're going to have uh, more electricity conducted down lead 2 is going to cause there to be a higher amplitude of the P wave in lead 2. So if you have a uh, P wave that is greater than two boxes tall, um, then uh, you're going to have, that is going to be indicative of right atrial enlargement. So for lead V1, the first upstroke of the P wave um, is going to represent the, um, the right atria. So if you can fit more than one little box inside the uh, upstroke of the P wave, this is indicative of right atrial enlargement. And uh, oftentimes you'll see this paired with right ventricular hypertrophy. So right here we can see in lead two, we have a tall P wave greater than two, usually two and a half little boxes. And we see that, see right here in V1, the first part of, of the P wave, which is the upstroke, is also greater than uh, one millimeter squared. So you can fit one little box in there. And these are pointed P waves. So left atrial enlargement, usually you're gonna say that the P wave is greater than two boxes wide. So this makes sense because the left atria is depolarized after the right atria. So if the left atria is larger, it's gonna take a longer time to fully depolarize the left atria. So this is going to cause a longer duration of the P wave. Um, and sometimes the P wave may even have a small notch, which is called P mitrally. So similar to the uh, V1 um, interpretation for right atrial enlargement, you can see that the downstroke of the P wave, which is going to represent the left atrial depolarization, may be more than one small box uh, down. So here we see in lead two, we see that this is a wide P wave, again, because it's taking longer t a longer time to depolarize the uh, left atria, which gets depolarized after the right atria because the sinus node is in the high right atrium. We can even see a little notch here because the uh, depolarization of the atria is separated in, uh, by so much in time that you have the, the right atria finishing its depolarization and then the start of the left atrial depolarization. And then the downstroke here in V1, the area uh, of this downstroke is greater than one millimeter squared, meaning that you can, uh, it is larger than one little box. Right ventricular hypertrophy, um, oftentimes there's a lot of different reasons that you can have a large R wave in V1, but in the right clinical context, an R wave greater than the S S wave in lead V1 can be indicative of right ventricular hypertrophy. This again goes back to normal conduction. So in V1, we see that there's the tug of war between the um, 
right ventricle and the left ventricle. And usually an S wave predominates because the left ventricle will normally win that tug of war because it's more, ax uh, more massive. However, if the right ventricle is much larger, then um, an R wave will predominate because the right ventricle is going to be more in line with the vector of, the, of lead V1. Other criteria that's sometimes used is that if you add the R wave in V1 to the S wave in V5 or V6, whichever is larger, if this is greater than or equal to 11 millimeters, this is indicative of right ventricular hypertrophy. So some causes of right ventricular hypertrophy include pulmonary hypertension. So basically, if the, heart, if the right heart is pushing against a uh, larger pressure, it's going to cause the right ventricle to uh, enlarge, causing right ventricular hypertrophy. Pulmonary embolism, for a similar reason, because it's going, it, the uh, right heart is going to have to push against this clot. COPD, which causes pulmonary hypertension. Congenital heart disease, such as tetralogy of below or pulmonary stenosis. Again, these are both um, diseases that can cause more pressure um, in the right ventricle. And then another one is arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, which is a sometimes a um, cause of an enlarged right ventricle. So here we can see there's a large R wave in V1, and this R wave is much greater than the, than the S wave. And if we uh, try to enact the uh, criteria, so if we add this, this R wave to the S waves that we see in, in V5 or V6, it's much greater than 11 millimeters. So left ventricular hypertrophy, there's a variation of uh, criteria that are used. And uh, the most uh, accurate is actually the Cornell criteria. But I also like to mention the Sokolow Lyons criteria because this lets you understand the uh, anatomy of the ECG. So basically, as we said before, the S wave in V1 and V2 uh, represent the depolarization of the left ventricle. And uh, this again is because of that tug of war that we see with the vectors. So if you take the S wave in V1 or V2, which represents the left ventricle, and then you add it to the height of the R wave in V5 or V6, which again is going to represent the left ventricle. Um, if this is greater than 35 millimeters, it's suggestive of left ventricular hypertrophy. Another thing that we can think of is the R wave uh, in AVL, if that is greater than or equal to 11 millimeters. So as we can see, we enlarge the left ventricle, here's lead 1, here's lead AVL, there's going to be more myocardium here, this is directed along AVL, so if it's greater than 11 millimeters, that's going to be suggestive of left ventricular hypertrophy. So now the Cornell criteria is going to be a little bit more accurate. So again, we have the R wave in AVL greater than or equal to 11 millimeters as part of that. And then we can take the S wave depth in V3 and add it to the height of the R wave in AVL, which again is going to represent the um, left ventricle. If it's greater than 20 millimeters in a woman or 28 millimeters in a man, this is indicative of left ventricular hypertrophy. So as we can see here, this R wave is greater than 11 millimeters. And then if we add this S wave, whether this patient is a man or a woman, it's definitely going to be greater than 28 millimeters. So that's indicative of left ventricular hypertrophy. So looking at waveforms, we can also think of Q waves. So Sometimes we can see normal Q waves, and um, a significant Q wave is one that has a width uh, and depth greater than one millimeter. It can represent a past infarction. You can think of it as losing the electrical contribution uh, over the area of the myocardium that is um, directed along the vector of the lead. Uh, so if you lose this, 
then basically the tissue behind the dead myocardium is, is still able to contribute, which is going to register in the opposite direction, which is going to be a Q wave. So basically, you think of this here. So if we draw that heart again, and we look at indeed three, need AVF, need two. If we infarct this area, there's no longer going to be vectors directed along these arrows. But the area of the heart that is on the opposite side is still going to be able to contribute. So on the ECG, it looks something like this. So this would be a significant Q wave. So here's an example of some, of some Q waves. So we can see in two, in three, in AVF, that uh, there's downward deflections where there should normally be upward deflections. Outside of that, you can look at the R wave progression. So normally, there should only be a small R wave in V1, and it gets larger as you progress to V6. So the transition point where the R wave becomes larger than the S wave occurs somewhere between V3 and V4. So there's a multitude of reasons that you can have some uh, abnormal R wave progression. So if you have a tall R wave in V1, it could be due to right ventricular hypertrophy, a right bundle branch block, which we'll talk about a little bit later, a posterior MI, basically you can think of this as there's a reflected Q wave, dextrocardia, so the patient's heart is actually in the opposite direction, other types of abnormal um, pre-excitation, a misplaced lead, and then reasons that there may be poor progression and basically the S wave doesn't uh, uh, become an R wave or transition somewhere between V3 and V4. It could be related to ischemia, cardiomyopathies, or uh, left interior hemi blocks. So here is an example. We can see that for this patient, there's an S wave here in V1, S wave in V2, S wave in V3, and we don't see a uh, transition to an R wave really until we get to V6. Normally it should be somewhere between V3 and V4, whereas um, V4 should be where the R wave takes over. Then the last thing that we can think of is ST and T wave segment changes. So the most important thing to remember is that you should always take into account the clinical context before you interpret an ST or T wave change as an MI. And uh, myocardial infarctions are not diagnosed only based on the ECGs. Um, other things to think of are peak T waves. So normally an, a T wave should be asymmetric, um, which is basically where it's going to take a little bit longer to rise than it will to fall. But uh, if we see one that is uh, more symmetric and more pointed, that could represent a hyperacute T wave that could be associated with infarction or could be associated with hyperkalemia. So the peak T waves that we usually see in hyperkalemia, um, we can say that they are usually going to be about 10 millimeters uh, in the precordial leads, so greater than 10 millimeters in height and symmetric, or greater than 5 millimeters in the limb leads. So basically you can think of it as 5 millimeters, 5 fingers on each hand, so a hand is a limb, and then the precordial or chest leads takes two hands to go across the chest, so that would be um, 10. Um, so another thing to think of is that if the height of the um, T wave is greater than three-fourths the height of the maximal deflection of the QRS, so for example if it's an S wave, and then the T wave, so basically if this is greater than three-fourths of this depth, or if an R wave is the maximum deflection, if this is greater than three-fourths of this, that would be a peak T wave. So here's an example of uh, peak T waves. So we can see here, height here is greater than five in a limb lead. And uh, this is definitely greater than 10 in V2, 
and this is also greater than three-fourths the maximal deflection of the S wave. So this is a patient with hyperkalemia. So T wave inversions can sometimes be seen. They can be associated with a lot of different things. Oftentimes, um, they're noted to be associated with ischemia, but you can also see these in cerebral hemorrhage. Um, abnormal depolarization seen in right bundle branch blocks, left, both bundle, left bundle branch blocks, and left ventricular hypertrophy. But as with any changes on an ECG, they must be in at least two contiguous anatomically grouped leads to be significant. So here we can see that, that this patient has T-wave inversions that we can see in lead 1 and lead AVL. These are contiguous leads, so these are said to be significant. You can also see them throughout the precordial leads. ST segment depressions can be related to ischemia. Um, different morphologies are often noted. Um, people will refer to them as horizontal, upsloping, or downsloping. And they can uh, be seen in the strain pattern of uh, ventricular hypertrophy or a bundle branch block. So here we can see uh, this is a patient who actually has depressions during a stress test. And we can see here in lead 2, ST depression, AVF, and lead 3, ST depression, as well as here in B4, B5, and B6. ST elevations, um, unlike T wave inversions and ST depressions, actually do correlate with a, uh, the anatomy of the heart and can, in their correct clinical uh, context be interpreted as uh, ischemia associated with a specific anatomical region of the heart. So usually for an ST depression to or ST elevation to be um, uh, significant it has to be one millimeter above the TP segment in at least two contiguous leads. So causes of ST elevations um, usually an MI, so an ST elevation MI is the biggest one that people think about. But other than MI, you could have a ventricular aneurysm. So basically there's a thinned out piece of the ventricle from a previous infarction. Pericarditis, so inflammation of the, of the pericardium, which is the membrane that uh, wraps around the heart muscle. And then early repolarization, which is a benign variant, sometimes seen in uh, young men. Uh, and usually the, these patients will be asymptomatic and not having chest pain. So as we can see here, right here is the ST segment, and it is very much elevated above the TP segment right here. So we see that this patient has elevations in B2, B3, B4, and B5. So B3 and B4 are, are the anterior uh, leads, and B2 and B5 are just on the outside of that. So this patient is having an anterior ST elevation MI. Okay. Then another um, interpretation that you uh, want to make when looking at an ECG is bundle branch blocks. So for a right bundle branch block versus a left bundle branch block, there are a lot of different criteria, but what I think is the easiest to remember is to look at B1 and B5 or B6. So usually, when you're looking at the precordial leads, so I'll just draw B1 and B6 just for simplicity. So you're going to have your normal conduction through the atria. And then as you conduct through the ventricles, conduct through the ventricles, you're going to have the left to right depolarization from the septal branch of the left bundle. And then you're going to conduct through the ventricles. And the um, left ventricle is going to win this tug of war. So you'll get a predominantly S wave in V1. So normally, it should look something, the QRS should look something like this. So if the patient has a uh, right bundle branch block, meaning that the portion of the conduction system that overlays the right ventricle is knocked out and they have cell-to-cell -cell conduction in this area, what's usually going to happen 
is that they, they will usually have that left to right depolarization causing the septum, in B, the septal R wave in we V1. Then they'll start to depolarize the ventricle. And uh, the area that overlays the right ventricle will be slowed and it'll have a bizarre wide pattern, which is going to produce a large wide R wave. Then as we look at V6, it's going to be directed in the opposite area. So one thing that you want to think about is that you know, for a right bundle branch block, it has to have a wide R wave in V1. So sometimes people say the bunny ears, which is RSR prime. But technically, if somebody had a Q wave in V1 because they had an old septal MI, they would only have a wide R wave in V1. So there's that. If we looked at the left bundle, so again, if we kind of knock out the left side, we're going to have wide cell-to-cell -cell conduction directed over this portion of the ECG, so going the opposite direction of V1. And for V6, it'll be the bizarre cell-to-cell -cell conduction will be directed along V6, so causing there to be an R wave. So thinking about this, criteria for a right bundle branch block is going to be a wide bizarre R wave in V1, and then S waves that are wide in V6, V5, V6, and also lead one, which is anatomically very close. Looking for the left bundle branch block, it's going to be a wide S wave in V1, because remember that this is going the opposite direction of, of the uh, vector of the V1 lead, and um, a large wide R wave along V6 because the vector of the abnormal conduction is going to be directed more along V6. So how I remember this is that there's predominantly an S wave in V1 in normal conduction and a left bundle branch block that's just a wide S wave. Predominantly an R wave in, in V6 in normal conduction with a left bundle branch block it's a wide R wave in V6. This is because the abnormal conduction is directed along those leads. For a right bundle branch block, it's a wide R wave that's directed along V1 and a wide S wave that's directed along V6. So you can think of the maximal deflection of a left bundle branch block as being this, the same general direction as normal, while a right bundle branch block is going to be the opposite direction. So basically some causes of a right bundle branch block and a left bundle branch block. So for a right bundle branch block it could be primary conduction disease, it could be a normal variant, pulmonary disease that causes larger pressures in the right ventricle which pushes on the bundle causing conduction to um, be disturbed. Um, right ventricular overload, ischemia can cause a right bundle, and cardiomyopathies. Pacing from the left ventricle can give you right bundle morphology because if you have the pacemaker leads in the left ventricle, you're going to have a lot of cell-to-cell -cell conduction in the right ventricle, giving you a similar morphology. For a left bundle, um, it's always pathologic, so it can either be primary conduction disease um, sometimes ischemia, basically causing there to be less uh, blood flow to the left bundle. Left ventricular hypertrophy uh, can cause abnormal conduction in the left bundle and cardiomyopathies. And again, thinking about it as pacing from the right ventricle um, can give a left bundle branch morphology. So here's a right bundle branch block. And we can see right here, there's the wide R waves in uh, V1, and then there is the wide S waves that you can see here in V5, V6. And then for the left bundle branch block, you can see that there's a wide S wave in V1 and a wide R wave in V6. 
can be one. Okay, so I think we can kind of stop there. The practice ECGs can.